Hi guys! Welcome everybody! Today we're gonna go to the science lab and we're gonna do a lot of experiments and introduce you to a lot of tools, a lot of things that we used to get the measurements and to separate the mixtures and solutions from each other. So let's start! So we're gonna introduce you to the apparatus that measure time, volume, mass and temperature. So as we know, time can be measured by stopwatch or stop clock and it's very important for physics and chemistry or even biology because it allows us to measure the rate of reaction, it measures the time spent and the reactions or changing of these materials. Temperature can be measured by thermometer. We have different shades of thermometers. We have alcoholic, we have electronic, and we have the mercury. And temperature has a lot of units. The units that are used here: Celsius or Fahrenheit and Kelvin. Mass can be measured by balance. We have different shapes and types of balances. We have electrical or digital balance, and we have double pan balance. The volume of liquid can be measured by different tools like volumetric flask, pipette, measuring cylinder, and pipette. But they have a lot of differences in their accuracy. So the most accurate one is the volumetric pipette. And then pipette is considered as another accurate uh, apparatus for measuring the volume of liquid. But it can measure different values. Um, volumetric flask is accurate yeah it's good for dissolving solid in liquid but the least accurate is the measuring cylinder now if you have the puret or pipe it it will be like graduated to different numbers so if you want to get the right measurement or let's say accurate reading of your measurement your eye should be vertical to the reading and your eye should be in the line with the bottom of the meniscus what is the meaning of your your measurements are accurate for example the accuracy describe how your value or how how your measurement is close to the true value so as we see the true value in here is the middle so we can consider these two values are close to the center whereas this is not accurate because it's far away okay for accuracy if you want to make your measurements so accurate you have to repeat the experiment in the same way each time. It means in the same way, I mean like you're fixing the conditions around the experiment so you can get more accurate experiment. So use a apparatus with the small scale divisions. It helps you for the uncertainty. If the uncertainty is a small value, it will be better for you. And you have to use the apparatus carefully. As a result of using the apparatus in a wrong way, it causes a lot of mistakes and errors and personal error is considered as one of these mistakes. Volumetric pipettes are made in only a few sizes. The most common being 10 cm cube and 25 cm cube. And they are very, very, very accurate. Pudits are another accurate tools for measuring the volume of liquids and they can be used accurately delivering up to 50 centimeter cube of liquid so they can relatively occupy a big volume of liquids um, volumetric flask can be used to make up a solution of dissolved solid in liquid accurately so as we notice there is a line on the volumetric flask that determine the level of liquid so if you exceed the line the concentration of your solution won't be that accurate. We're gonna go to learn a lot of separating methods that used to separate mixtures into their components. So let's start. When you want to separate any mixture, you have to put in your mind. The separating method depends on the type of mixture that you used and it depends on the substance that you want to separate. And now, if you want to separate a solid substance from liquid, we have a lot of techniques like filtration, decanting, centrifuge, and evaporation. So when to use these techniques? 
Let's start with the filtration process, which is one of the most powerful separating techniques that used to separate the undissolved solid and liquid. We're going to use a filter paper and fennel and filter flask. The filter paper will be like a trap for the substance that cannot pass through it. We call the substance that was trapped inside the filter paper a residue. The substance that passed through the filter paper is called filtrate. And let's do the filtration process experimentally. As we see, we have a mixture of sand and water, filter fennel, filter flask, and the filter paper. So let's just start to preparing the filter paper for the filtration process. We fold it several times, and then as we see, we put it inside the filter funnel and start the filtration process. The substance that is strapped inside the filter paper is called residue, whereas the substance that passes through the filter paper is called filtrate. And now, let's talk about the decanting, which is another separating technique that separates the undissolved solid and liquid. After a while, the solid particles start to settle down in the bottom of bigger or container. So it leaves the solution so clear so you can pour it off and you can separate it easily and now let's do this separating method experimentally i prepared a mixture of sand and water and i left it for several hours and i noticed what happens to the particles of sands when they start after a while we got a clear solution and the subtle particles of sands below so we pour off the solution and we got it so clear Evaporation process can be used to extract the solid from liquid, so it can be useful for extract the undissolved solid or dissolved solid from solution by applying heat. As a result of applying heat, all of liquid will evaporate and the solid left behind. We use evaporating dash to spell this in the substance and then apply heat. The evaporation dash is good because it has a big surface area. Centrifuge is one of the most powerful separating techniques, especially in medicine. Spinning around at high speed will be applied in a sample, so the sample contains solid and liquid. The solid will start to pull down as a result of the centrifuge force, whereas the liquid will stain the upper part of the sample. The liquid can be decanted off. Crystallization is a separating technique, and now we want to learn how to make the crystallization process. First, we dissolve the solid substance in the liquid, and then we apply heat. Applying heat leads to increase the solidity of the solid. We add more solid and dissolve it while heating, until the solutions become saturated. Saturated means no more solid can be dissolved. After that, we cool down the solution because the temperature starts to decrease. The solubility of the solid decreases, so they start to form lattice or crystals. After a while of cooling, we got the crystals by filtration process. Generally, crystallization process is a suitable technique for soils that have different solubilities so it's a recommended process. These are crystals and we got them by filtration process. Simple distillation is a beautiful separating technique that allows us to obtain the solvent from solution. If you have a dissolved solid and liquid, first of all you apply heat. As a result of applying heat, the evaporation process takes place. The vapor of liquid will hit the thermometer and it reads the boiling point of that liquid. Then the vapor will pass it through condenser. Condenser is look like two tubes, one of them in inside each other. The inner tube is for vapor and the outer tube is for water. The mission of water is cooling down the vapor. As a result of cooling down the vapor, the vapor turns to condense and then becomes liquid 
and the dripping starts to occur. The distilled substance is called distillate. The water in the condenser is in circulation. So we have a place where the water get inside the condenser and a place where the water get out. Now let's do the simple distillation experimentally. And now, we want to learn how to separate liquids dissolved in each other using a certain technique. This technique is called fractional distillation and it's used to separate the liquids from a mixture of miscible liquids. We use the fractional distillation when the boiling point of mixture of liquids are close to each other. we can use the fractional distillation to separate a mixture of ethanol and water. Ethanol boils at 75 Celsius degrees, whereas water boils at 100 Celsius degrees. So the difference between them is not that much. The only difference between the fractional distillation and simple distillation from the apparatus is the presence of the fractionating column. So I want to explain the fractional distillation in terms of mixture of ethanol and water. First of all, applying heat on the distillation flask that contains a mixture of ethanol and water. After that, both of water and ethanol start to evaporate. They hit the beads inside the fractionating column. So they turn back because the glass beads are not hot enough. So they start to condense again and dripping inside the distillation flask. After a while, when the glass beads get hot, ethanol which is lower piling point than water, it starts to escape through the beads and then it hits the thermometer. As a result of this, it comes to the condenser and condenses inside it. The reading of thermometer will be 75. When no longer ethanol inside the distillation flask, the reading of thermometer starts to increase. So we stop collecting ethanol. It means that there is no ethanol and we put another cup at the end of the condenser and then the water starts to condense. If you want to separate a mixture of alcohol as an example, it's preferable to use electrical source of heat rather than using flame because it's flammable. The most volatile substance will distill first, whereas the least volatile substance will distill last. The fractionating column contains beads. The mission of the fractionating column is providing a large surface area for vaporization and condensation of liquid mixture. Chromatography is a method of separating pigments, I mean colored substances, using filter paper or chromatography paper. By paper chromatography, we can identify the substance and the mixture and we can separate it into its component and we can check the purity of the substances as well. The splitting of pigments of the components of the colorful substances are due to the different solubilities in the solvent and because the pigment have different attraction between the paper. We can note that the most soluble substance will be the fastest to move on the paper.
if the pigment remains in its position it means this pigment is not solvent in this solvent so you have to find another solvent that will be suitable for this pigment one of the most common solvents in the chromatography world are water uh, methanol ethanol And now, let's do the chromatography paper experimentally. Let's start. The first thing we do is bring a filter paper or a chromatography paper and then we draw the baseline. The baseline should be drawn by pencil. There are a lot of reasons for this. So let's know what are these reasons. For example, if you use the pen that contains ink, ink is a mixture so it will be separated into its individual components on the chromatography paper as the solvent front advances up the paper. The second reason is, the graphite in pencil is not a mixture and it's not soluble. So it won't be dispersed across the paper as the solvent front moves over the paper. After drawing the baseline, we see add the dyes. As we see, we have four dyes and a mixture that contains these dyes or one or some of these dyes, so we're gonna know this later. And then we immerse this paper inside a solvent. The level of solvent should be below the baseline. Okay, and then after a while, the solvent starts to move up and then it reaches to a level. The level right here is called solvent front. Okay, as a result of moving the solvent, up, the dyes start to move up as well. We call this chart a chromatogram that shows the separating spots in the filter paper or chromatography paper. We can get a lot of information from this chromatogram. So the first thing we should know about it is dye A remains in its position, no change happens to it. So dye A is insoluble substance. Let's compare B and C. As we see, C is split into one spot, which means it contains only one substance. Dye C is a pure, whereas B it splits into two substances, so B is not pure. D is not pure as well. What can we note about this? We have three dyes, and they have different locations on the chromatogram. The most soluble one is the fastest one. So the fastest spot is this, which means this spot is the most soluble. Okay, what else? Can we know something else about it? Yeah, sure. This is the distance traveled by solvent, which is from the baseline to the solvent front. This is the distance traveled by pigment, which is from the baseline to the center of the pigment. So we can consider the travel distance from here or here or here. So it's a start from the baseline to the center of the spot. There is something called the retention factor. Retention factor is a specific features for substances in chromatography, which is a ratio between the distance traveled by pigment to the distance traveled by solvent. So we call this RF value. So where does the meaning of RF value and how to calculate it? Let's go. RF value, it comes from retention factor. We can calculate it by 
dividing the distance from the baseline to the center of the spot, which is the same distance traveled by spot over the distance of solvent front from the baseline, which is the distance traveled by solvent. So how to apply it? Let's start um, calculate the retention factor value of the first uh, spot in the mixture, which is this. As we know, the retention factor value equals to the distance traveled by pigment. So we want to measure the distance traveled by pigment number one here. So we put the ruler at the center of the spot to the baseline. So the distance is equal to four centimeters. Okay. What about the distance traveled by solvent? We use the ruler and then we measure it. As we see, the distance is 12 centimeters. Okay, and now let's go to calculate the RF value for the first spot. As we see, the first spot was 4 over 12. 4 centimeters the distance traveled by pigment and 12 is the distance traveled by solvent. And let's go to measure the second spot. We use the ruler as well, um, and as we see, the distance is equal to 8.5 centimeters. Okay, so let's go to the mixture again, and as we see, the second spot equals 8.5 divided by 12 equals 0.71. Okay, what about the third value? As we see, the distance here is equal to 10.5 centimeter, so let's go and Calculate the RF value for the third spot, which is equals 10.5 divided by 12 equals 0.88. Can we apply chromatography and colorless substances? The answer is yeah. Uh, we use an, a chemical substance called locating agents, and we have different types of them. Locating agents' mission is make the colorless chromatogram visible. We can separate the locating agents and then we put the chromatogram in oven or something like this and then it gives color of these spots. Nanhydrin is an example of locating agents and we can use the locating agents and separating of amino acids because amino acids are colorless. The compounds in chromatogram can be identified using their RF values because RF values like fingerprints of substances or compounds. The higher RF value will be the more soluble and solvent um hopefully guys you enjoy this video and you understand everything if you have any questions you can ask me in the comments below have a nice day